up, Shrooms? How y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. So, even though finasteride has been the first line of defense against androgenic alopecia since 1992, when the drug was first introduced to the market, hair loss sufferers for ages have been looking for effective adjunct treatments for finasteride. Of course, we also have minoxidil, which is an effective adjunct treatment, but minoxidil, what it is, it's a growth stimulant which works independently from hormonal mechanisms. So, as effective as it is, it doesn't really target hair loss at its source, since after all, it is the trash hormone DHT that causes hair loss. And whatever we do in our quest to stop hair loss, we need to use something to suppress that hormone if we want to stop hair loss long term. Fortunately, the use of a 5-air inhibitor like finasteride is enough for the overwhelming majority of people. But why is it, you may ask, that we lower DHT by suppressing the 5-air pathway, which converts testosterone into DHT? Wouldn't it be more effective to block DHT with a direct androgen antagonist? Well, obviously, an androgen antagonist administered orally is not a viable option for cisgendered men, since it targets all androgens, testosterone included, which of course is not not a trash hormone like DHT. But how about administering androgen antagonists topically as opposed to orally? Well, unfortunately, most of these direct anti-androgens like topical flutamide, bicalutamide, or to topical ciproterone cannot be used even topically without compromising our virility since they do absorb systemically. But there do exist some topical anti-androgens that can be used safely. These days, a popular choice includes fluoridyl, which is an anti-androgen that is chemically similar to flutamide, except it is hydrophobic, meaning it is deactivated when it enters the bloodstream, thus negating the risk of side effects. There are also upcoming topical anti-androgens in the pipeline that are currently undergoing clinical trials, such as pyrolutamide and clascoterone. And while these are exciting, none of them have yet even proven to be useful as anything more than just adjuncts for finasteride. Make no mistake, while topical androgen antagonists might be useful, 5-AR inhibitors like finasteride or dutasteride are absolutely still the gold standard when it comes to fighting hair loss because of their ability to markedly lower scalp DHT safely even while using low doses of the drug. Interestingly enough though, there is one anti-androgen that I had thought was all but forgotten about, but now thanks to some new research, it has been generating a bit of hype in the hair loss community, and that compound is topical spironolactone. So, the story behind spironolactone is interesting because it is similar to the story behind minoxidil. Minoxidil was developed as a treatment for high blood pressure and incidentally was found to cause hair growth. Similarly, spironolactone was developed as a diuretic but also was found to cause hair growth. Further research showed that spironolactone is a moderately effective androgen receptor blocker and it also blocks some steps in the synthesis of testosterone. So it can directly lower testosterone at high doses. The way it works as an androgen blocker is that it basically is a very, very weak androgen that competes with the androgen receptors in your cells and thus prevents stronger androgens like testosterone and DHT from binding with them. As such, the drug when used for androgen suppressing purposes can cause hypogonadism and even feminization. In fact, at high doses, it is even used by male to female trans women to help them transition. It is important to note, though, that spironolactone doesn't exhibit anti-androgenic properties unless it is prescribed at higher doses, usually 100 milligrams or more. So it isn't a treatment you can microdose orally as a way to get around its feminizing side effects. And I only bring that up because I know some people have actually tried to do that. On the other hand, Oral spironolactone can be a viable treatment for women's hair loss, and I made a video about that, which I'll link below, but it is absolutely not a viable treatment for cisgendered men, so don't try to use it unless you're transgendered. So just like minoxidil is now used in a topical form in order to avoid its dangerous systemic side effects, spironolactone can be used topically as well. Now, topical spironolactone has been around for a long time. It used to get a lot of hype in the 2000s and early 2010s as potentially being a finasteride alternative alternative, or at worst, at least being a fairly powerful adjunct to an existing hair loss stack. These days, though, until recently, topical spironolactone has been rarely talked about at all. It was overshadowed by newer treatments like fluoridyl, alpha tradiol, and even research chemicals like RU58841, which has also been around for a while, but still gets a fair amount of hype despite the lack of clinical data on its safety and efficacy. 
Nevertheless, there has been a resurgence of interest in topical spironolactone due to a recent article that compared it to topical minoxidil. So let's go ahead and take a balls deep look at this new research that is causing all this hype about a once thought extinct topical antiandrogen for hair loss, topical spironolactone. So like I said, just last year, this article was published in 2021. It was an article from Egypt that was published comparing topical spironolactone with topical minoxidil. It is titled, quote, a novel topical combination of minoxidil and spironolactone for androgenetic alopecia, clinical, histopathological, and physiochemical study, unquote. This was a randomized controlled study of 60 subjects. There were 39 men and 21 women, all with androgenic alopecia aged 18 to 45 years old. The subjects were divided into three groups of 20 people. The first group received topical minoxidil, the second received topical spironolactone, and the third group received a combination of both minoxidil and spironolactone. In this study, each subject served as their own control. Hair growth was compared before and after treatment using global photographs that were assessed by one of the researchers who was blinded as to what treatment they were receiving. But there was no separate control group who just got a placebo treatment, which is a limitation for the study, since believe it or not, sometimes just taking a placebo treatment can result in some hair growth, and if you don't include a placebo group, you can overestimate the effects of an active treatment. Fortunately, the investigators also did scalp biopsies at the beginning of the study and at the end of the study, which was after 12 months. In these biopsies, they looked at the number of antigen growth phase hairs, the number of telogen resting phase hairs, and the number of vellus hairs, which are miniaturized hairs, and this kind of microscopic evaluation is a much more objective assessment than just looking at photographs. Interestingly, the researchers didn't use the standard minoxidil liquid or foam we're all familiar with. Instead, they created a new homemade formulation, which was a 5% gel. The spironolactone was used as a 1% gel, and the combination groups received a gel containing both drugs together. Part of the study involved doing chemical tests on the combination gel to make sure the two drugs didn't interact with each other in the gel, but I can summarize that part of the research briefly by saying they found no problems for mixing both drugs together in a gel form. What we're most interested in, of course, is the hair growth results. Well, to summarize the photographic results, in group one, the minoxidil-only group, 90% of subjects were responders to treatment, and four had excellent, six had good, two had fair, and six had had poor results. In group two, the spironolactone group, there was a slightly lower response rate of 80% with five subjects with excellent, four with good, and seven with poor response. The final group, which is the group which used a combination of minoxidil and spironolactone, had the best results. There was a 100% response rate with eight having an excellent result, 10 with a good result, two with a fair result, and none with a poor result or no result. This figure here shows examples of results in the three groups. Of course, it's hard to judge the overall results based on individual results, but at least in all three of these individuals, there appears to be good results. Also, statistically, the combination of minoxidil and spironolactone was significantly better than either drug used alone. Now, if we look at the scalp biopsies, all three groups showed improvements. In the minoxidil-only group, the average number of angin growth phase hairs went from 9.1 to 12.1. In the spironolactone-only group, the average number of antigen growth hairs went from 7.8 to 10.1 hairs. The group that combined spironolactone and minoxidil had antigen hairs go from 4.7 to 9.7. All these changes were statistically significant. So judging by the magnitude of the the effect. It looks like the combination was best, but the researchers don't quote any statistics comparing the three groups with one another. So unlike with the photographic results, I don't think we can conclude from the biopsy results that the combination group was better than either therapy alone. All three treatment groups also saw significant decreases in telogen and vellus hairs. This figure shows some of the changes seen in the scalp on spironolactone. There are more antigen growth hairs shown by the black arrows and fewer telogen resting hair shown by the yellow arrows. Similar changes were seen with the other treatment groups. Regarding side effects, there was contact dermatitis in 20% of patients, but the investigators don't mention if this was worse with minoxidil or spironolactone or if both caused the same amount of dermatitis. The dermatitis was, quote, 
mild and endurable, unquote. There were fortunately no sexual side effects and no gynecomastia occurred as well, which is good because gyno is definitely a side effect of oral spironolactone. So it seems like at least topical spironolactone doesn't have much systemic absorption. So this is a small study, but it suggests that topical spironolactone might be just slightly less effective than topical minoxidil, which already works very well. And the researchers suggest that the combination of the two drugs was better than either drug alone. However, I think the numbers are too small to conclude that spironolactone is worse than minoxidil, and I also think the numbers are too small to conclude that the combination of minoxidil plus spironolactone is better than either drug alone. There were only 20 subjects in each group, and there was no true control group in this study. Also, the investigators are basing their conclusions on global photographs, which can be very subjective. The scalp biopsies showed significant changes in all three groups, but the researchers don't give any stats suggesting the combination therapy was better than either therapy alone when judged by scalp biopsies. But I think we can at least conclude that topical spironolactone has some effects. After all, it is an androgen receptor blocker and so will therefore probably lower DHT in the scalp. But I have to agree with the investigators when they say, quote, these results have yet to be confirmed by long-term studies to deeply evaluate their efficacy and safety with larger number of subjects, unquote. So yeah, we can probably conclude that there is at least a decent chance that topical spironolactone helps a little bit, but what about compared to other topicals besides minoxidil? Well, there isn't much data, but we do have one study that compares topical spironolactone to topical finasteride. Sadly, though, this is not exactly what most would consider to be a great study. It's also from Egypt and was published in 2020. The title is, quote, Topical finasteride versus topical spironolactone in the treatment of androgenetic alopecia, unquote. In this study, the researchers looked at 32 subjects with androgenic alopecia. Half the subjects were men and half were women. The subjects were divided into two groups. One group received topical finasteride 0.1% solution. The other got topical spironolactone 5% solution. There is no mention as to whether these solutions were applied once or twice per day. Also, like in the previous study we discussed, there was no true control group that just received a placebo treatment. In this study, the results were based on treatment micrograms done before and after six months of treatment in each group. So it doesn't sound like too bad of a study design since the investigators used trichograms, which are pretty objective as opposed to photographs that can be misleading due to different angles, different lighting and hairstyling, etc. The problem with this study though is that the conclusions from the study don't seem to follow from the results. Also, the study is written in a strange way. The method section is very short and the actual methods are included in the results section. Most most of the results actually appear in the discussion section. This discussion section just repeats the results shown in the tables and it is virtually complete gibberish. Whoever was the medical editor who accepted this paper, they were asleep at the switch clearly. Let's try to decipher the results here. In this table, the researchers showed that there was no difference in the trichogram results between topical spironolactone and topical finasteride in men. And in this table, they showed there was no difference for females either. For some reason, the investigators look at some more obscure trichogram features rather than hair counts. They looked at hair diameter diversity, which is higher in androgenetic alopecia because there is a mix of normal sized hair and miniaturized hair. They also looked at what's called atrichia, which is areas with no hair growth. Obviously, the more atrichia you have, the more bald you will be. And they also looked at what's called the propyler sign, which is some darkening of the skin around the hair, which supposedly correlates with inflammation around the hair follicles that can be seen in androgenic alopecia. So as hoped for, the trichoscopic features of androgenic alopecia generally improved with both treatments, but there were no statistically significant differences between the two treatments. However, despite this, the researchers for some reason concluded that topical spironolactone was better than topical finasteride. They say, quote, our study shows that topical spironolactone is better than topical finasteride in male and female groups. Topical spironolactone and topical finasteride in female group were better than topical spironolactone and topical finasteride in male group. Unquote. Huh? 
Something must be lost in the translation here. Maybe this last page in the study explains it, but I don't read Elvish, so I'm kind of left in the dark here. But this study is clearly pretty bad. Now, I've reviewed topical finasteride many times before, and I'll go ahead and link some of the more recent videos I've made on the subject in case you haven't seen them yet. But the bottom line is that topical finasteride, it is effective, but there are systemic effects. So it's not the perfect alternative to oral finasteride some hope for in order to avoid oral finasteride's very low risk of side effects. However, I have to say that this study is such a mess that it is impossible to conclude anything from it, other than like in the earlier study we talked about, topical spironolactone has some effectiveness, but I don't think we have enough data to compare it to an established treatment like topical minoxidil, or even know how it measures up to topical finasteride. So the bottom line is that while I would never trust something with limited data like topical spironolactone to be used in place of a 5AR inhibitor like finasteride, I still think some of the existing data indicates it may at least have some utility as an adjunct treatment to an existing hair loss stack. Overall though, it is nothing to get too excited about, especially since we have far more promising topical antiandrogens in development like pyrolutamide, which will likely render spironolactone obsolete. And I did a video about pyrolutamide, which I'll link below if you want more of an in-depth explanation about that compound, which is coming out fairly soon, maybe in a year or two. Also, I should mention that topical spironolactone is something I have actually tried before, and even though I didn't use it for very long term, just a few months, I didn't notice any benefit from it. In fact, the only thing I remember about it was how disgusting it smelled, almost like a combination of cheap rubber and a lemon-scented perfume or something. It was very gross, and it was pungent enough that I could smell it even hours after applying it to my scalp. Truth be told, though, there probably isn't much point in incorporating spironolactone into your routine. Finasteride is going to be good enough to control androgens for the overwhelming majority of people, and if finasteride asteroid isn't enough, it would be much more convenient and cheaper to just use a stronger 5AR inhibitor like dutasteride, especially since dutasteride can be easily titrated safely up to 2.5 milligrams daily in the case of extreme hair loss, and I have a video that discusses dutasteride dosing too if you wish to learn more about that. So go ahead and try spironolactone if you want to. Couldn't hurt, I suppose, but for me personally, I don't think suppressing a few more androgens is worth making my scalp smell like lemon-scented condoms all day. Day, but that's just me. Anyways, until next time, my fellow hair loss witchers, good luck on the path. I'll see you next time. Take care.